Hey everyone, welcome to the Base Hang Podcast. I am Steve Araujo. Today, my friend Robert Kearns, longtime bassist for Sheryl Crow, joins us. We have a great conversation. It's pretty incredible the people that he's played with. And I had no idea that he was actually in Leonard Skinner for a few years, which is amazing. He's got some great stories, and I always like to talk to bass players that are working and have been out there touring recording and uh, I really I really like getting the insight onto how they approach gigs, um, how they approach recording, the gear they're using of course because this is the bass hang we like to nerd out on that but it's just really incredible. I, I really enjoy speaking to my fellow musicians and uh, these guys are out there working super hard and obviously the last couple of years have been a little trying so I always like to find out how they spent their time, how they did some pivoting from being out on the road all the time to being home and what they were doing. So I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. My buddy Robert Kearns, amazing Nashville bassist, plays with everybody, longtime Sheryl Crow bass player. So enjoy it. Robert Kearns, everybody. Hey, everybody. Steve Rahu here, the Bass Hang Podcast. I am super excited to have my friend Robert Kearns on today. Thanks for joining, man. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for asking. Absolutely, man. And uh, as, you, as you were saying, okay, so you were at the Super Bowl just yesterday. Yes, we just uh, flew back last night. Okay. So that's uh, why I'm still kind of a, <laughs> just got up a little bit ago. So. And you and yeah. you play with Sheryl Crow, and you've been Sheryl Crow's bassist for, for some time now, right? Yes, just over uh, 10 years now. Yeah. So, so what was the gig yesterday? Where'd you guys, what was it? Uh, you guys... It was, uh, we actually played twice. We did a three piece, uh, acoustic set, uh, Cheryl, myself and Tim Smith. Okay. Um, and where, where was it at? At one of the parties or in the, actual yes, stage? they had, uh, they had two separate stages. We did, um, we did like a VIP, uh, tent, okay. uh, on one side of the stadium, uh, and we played, uh, we played about, I guess, 30 minutes or so on the acoustic set. Very good. And then uh, we uh, left there and went over to the other side of the um, stadium where they had a full, huge stage set up in the parking lot. Massive. And uh, so we played there for about 45 minutes. A full, full band, electric. Got yeah. it. So for the acoustic yeah. set, what do you... So it's all toned down. What do you play? Obviously, you don't play. Do you play? I just play. I play actually electric bass, but it's uh, sometimes it's just through the monitors or Got if it. we have in ears, we use in ears sometimes. Dude, that's an easy setup. You just plug yeah. in. Good yeah. Good guy, and that's it. And that's it. Yeah, yeah. Were you able to watch the game at all? No, uh, I actually. Uh, they they gave us a uh, Cheryl got to go with her kids, which was great because they're and it actually turned out good for them because they're Kansas City fans. So uh, and and, uh, and they're very happy with the outcome. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. That's, that's cool. So basically, I have some notes here. Yeah, some notes. So where did you did you get? So right now you're in Nashville. I'm in Nashville, yes. And did you grow up in, in Tennessee, or where'd you grow up? No, I actually grew up in uh, North Carolina. Wow, yes, okay. just uh, a, a little town called Conover, North Carolina. All right. It's about an hour north of Charlotte. Okay. And about an hour and 15 minutes east of Asheville, North Carolina. Very good. And schooling, you grew up, went to school there. Did you go to college? Uh, right yep. Did you? I went to uh, Newton Conover High School. Go Red Devils. There we go. I always <laughs> yeah. try to promote them when I can. <laughs> nice. And uh, I actually went to a community college there, uh, Catawba Valley uh, Community okay. College, nice. CVCC. Is that and where you kind of started your music um well, I actually uh, started taking lessons when I was a kid. Um, I wanted to take guitar lessons, and my dad he was uh, he wanted me to play banjo. He loved the banjo, so we uh, ultimately found a, a teacher, um, a guy named Bobby Denton, who's still uh, a great friend of mine to this day, a mentor to this day. Uh, so he lived about thirty. 30 miles away in a town called Morganton, North Carolina. So my dad would drive me up there every week to take a lesson. So I would take two lessons. I would take uh, 
uh, finger style guitar, like Chet Atkins sure. style oh, man. guitar. And then I would take a banjo lesson. So like the Earl Scruggs five string banjo. You don't get uh, any better than that. Him. Yeah, that's legendary. Yeah. So, uh, I, and I used to be fairly proficient. I was never, I never got to the point where I could like just take off and improvise on it, but I could do a lot of the scrub standard uh, tunes, flat and scrub. So, um, so it was fun. Yeah, it was a good, uh, uh, early on, Bobby, I remember him telling my dad uh, one time, because he, he was a great teacher where he would play along with me when he would show me a banjo tune. Okay. But he would never, if I got off time, he would not, he wouldn't correct. He would just keep going, you know, keep going with the correct uh, tempo and time of the song. Mm -hmm. And then I would catch back up. So when I did that, he saw that I could do that. I could hear <laughs> where I was supposed to be, but my fingers just weren't working correctly at the time. It's almost but he, like I remember him telling my dad, he was like, your son's got good time. So uh, I was like, well. That's good. <laughs> a lot of the times you have to do the the mind to the to the actual muscle memory connection. And that probably takes a little while, but he probably saw that you actually had something to give to that. So, you know, exactly. some proficiency. Absolutely. Right. So how yeah. about um, so from banjo guitar and then you jump to bass? Did you was that a, a big leap? And then also studying and reading music. Did you how did you navigate that? Well, um, so when I, by the time I, that was, I, I believe that was in, um, I was probably in seventh or eighth grade, something like that. And then, uh, of course, by the time I got to junior high school, then I, I caught the rock and roll bug. So then I wanted to move over to electric guitar. Okay. And uh, I, I got an electric guitar for Christmas. And uh, me and a buddy of mine, Jonathan Birchfield, who we still play together uh, to this day, uh, when we can, uh, we formed a little band in junior high school and just started playing around, you know, practicing in the basement, driving our parents crazy <laughs> with a loud racket down there. As and you're supposed to do. That's the dream. Exactly. You're supposed yeah. to do that. Yeah. Well, they were so sweet, you know, to, to have to endure that every Saturday listen to our racket but uh and another buddy greg simmons he played the drums okay and then we formed a band at that time i was just playing guitar mainly rhythm and uh um let a guy named alan wilkerson play bass at that time mm -hmm. so we just uh you know i caught the rock and roll bug so i kind of uh uh i didn't practice my banjo and uh the finger picking as much anymore so uh so yeah, from there we played for a number of years until uh, I got to where I graduated. And actually, Jonathan he picked up another gig uh, with a guy named Harry D Harry Dill and the Galaxies, who was like a local beach band legend. Okay. And uh, so that at that point, I got an offer to go with this uh, fairly successful regional band called Phoenix. Hmm. And but they needed a bass player. And uh, what happened was I was playing rhythm guitar at the time. And the drummer who uh, Dave Costner, who was the uh, leader of the band, he said, well, we need a bass player. And I was actually working at a new music store that had just opened up in Hickory okay. uh, Plaza Music. And they uh, and we had a bass there. And I asked the owner, can I take this bass home mm -hmm. and practice with it? And fairly uh early on uh it didn't take much time where i started you know the drummer gave me a list of songs sure. that they that they uh played and i started listening to these songs and it, it very soon i was like oh wow i can hear the bass uh, way better i can pick out the bass and hear what the bass is doing uh, much easier than the guitar parts and i just started playing the bass and practicing i was like and it dawned on me, I was, uh, I was, um, you know, it hit me. I was like, oh, this is the instrument I'm supposed to be playing, wow. the bass, because it, it came to me more naturally, actually. So um, oh, that's, that's kind of how that went. <laughs> that's cool. And then how about, so do you read music and did you go through all Well, that? now the reading part of the music came through uh, in junior high as well. I joined the uh, marching band. 
Okay. So I played saxophone in the in the band all the way through high school. So uh, what little knowledge of reading music it, it came through uh, the uh, tenor sax. Wow. So reading music in the marching band. But uh, from there, I kind of let that go by the wayside as well, and I've just uh, picked up everything by ear. Sure. But, but now giving a chart or something like that, you can navigate your way through it for a second. Yeah, I, uh, yeah. well, mainly here, you know, we do the Nashville number chart. Absolutely. So, yeah. 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 Okay. So uh, that's, the, that's the kind of charts that I read uh, mostly. Yeah. yeah, and you have to kind of know your stuff. You got to know the fretboard. You have to, you know, you have to know That's some right. kind of rhythms. You have to know, you know, I've I've got exactly. some, I've done some remote sessions for some friends, and yeah, they're great. But yeah. it's it's really a fantastic way of um, writing down on a piece of paper and you know a musical idea. That's more than yeah. just letters on top of words, you know, and and it's pretty fantastic. It's a great system. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and I, if I'm not mistaken, um, I think Charlie McCoy and uh, maybe some of the Jordan Ayers were responsible with coming up with, with, that, the, system? Uh, with, the, with that system. Wow. Yeah, that's cool. That, which is still in use, you know, every day here in this in this city. Oh, yeah. So when did you when did you make the jump to Nashville or, you know, from playing in the local circuit? To right. actually, you know, getting working your way up, you know, I mean, a lot of it is definitely word of mouth, who you know, you get a job from a job, you get a gig from a gig, which yeah. all of us have, you know, every working musician, that's kind of how it happens. But that's right. You know, there's some there's some jumps you have to make, and and how did you make the leap and and your move to Nashville? Because that's Music City, you know. What happened was um, in the in the nineties, uh, uh, me and my buddy Audley Freed, a guitar player who who also plays with Cheryl uh, now, uh, we had formed a band. Uh, we lived in Raleigh, so I I moved from my hometown of Conover mm -hmm. to Raleigh, North Carolina, to join a a a, a big regional band at that point called Sidewinder. Okay. They uh, they had been on. Uh, I don't know if you remember that show. Uh, Ed McMahon had a show called Star Search. Of course, uh, yeah, that was. A <laughs> but they they had been on that that show and made it to the quarterfinals, which was huge back then. You know, that was like the that's pre runner before American Idol and all. Big the, time, all America's the shows Got today. That's predecessor. That was like exactly the, the, the so that, that that band had, uh, and they were already kind of big uh, mm -hmm. in the on the East Coast. Okay. So uh, I moved to Raleigh to join that band, and I played uh, with them for four years. And then the last year that I was in the band, uh, Audley Freed mm -hmm. uh, joined the band. So we were in that band for about a year, and then we decided, look, we're going to form, let's form our own band, because sure. we loved uh, all the people in Sidewinder and playing with those guys, but we realized that for us to get you know, any bigger, we needed to play original music. So we formed our own band, and uh, we were based out of Raleigh, where we were living. And we actually uh, got a rehearsal space adjacent to the band. I don't know if you're familiar with COC, Corrosion of Conformity. Oh, we, we rehearsed right beside those guys, Pepper I, Keenan, metal hardcore band. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, late late yeah. '90s kind of. Yeah, they're yeah. Still, I think they're still around. They're still playing. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Uh, so we, uh, so anyway, uh, I'm, I'm kind of dragging this out, but a after years of, uh, uh, slugging it out, we ended up getting a, um, record deal with Columbia records and we, uh, put out a album and, uh, our, our first single actually went to number one on the rock AOR, mm. uh, the rock radio charts. Okay. Uh, so, um, you know, for, uh, for whatever that's worth. Yep. at the time but sure. but it it ended up uh uh letting us uh be able to go out and open up for uh we opened up for uh robert plant and aerosmith and zz top and this is in 1993 Whoa. So, yeah so uh we had a song i don't know 
Uh, by the title, you might not recognize it, but if you heard it, you may recognize it. It's a song called Peace Pipe. And it was uh, number one for four weeks on that on that chart. I'm gonna put a link. So, Peace Pipe by the band. What's the name of the band? Yeah, Cry of Love. Cry of Love. Okay. Yes. We're gonna. Yeah. I'll have people look for it. I'll put a little link. But that's. Yeah, very yeah, cool. yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so anyway, what happened was, uh, uh, so after we we toured for about a year and a half behind that record, it was called Bro the album was called Brother. Okay. And we recorded it in Muscle Shoals, man. We, uh, you know, which was always, you know, we were huge uh, fans of Muscle Shoals rhythm section. And, well, that's and, uh, renowned. I mean, are you kidding me? That's uh, what Dwayne Allman. Uh, absolutely. Was all yeah. Those guys. Wow. Uh, yeah. Everything that they did down there. Bob Seeger, you yes. know, yeah. Paul Simon, Rod Stewart, you know, the list goes on and on. And there's actually a great documentary about those guys. I, I've seen, yeah, I've, I've seen yeah. it. That's where I, I, I know a lot about that stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Great Did you get to hang with any of them or see them? Yes, they actually, at the time we recorded, uh, David Hood had an office there. Jimmy Johnson was still there. Okay. And uh, Roger Hawkins as well. So those three guys were still at the studio. Okay. Um, and uh, they were great, man. They would just tell us story after story, you know, especially Jimmy Johnson. Johnson, he got us in his office one day and told us about when Skinner recorded there, you know, and we were just amazed. And in fact, on one of the songs, um, um, I think it was um, uh, Don't uh, Hand Me Down was the name of the song. Okay. The engineer Steve Melton, who um, <coughs> who engineered a ton of stuff back in the sure. day at the from Muscle Shoals, mm -hmm. uh, he pulled out. He went and pulled out this box. It literally was uh, like a wooden box, and we opened it up, and it was nothing but a kind of like a garden hose wrapped up in it. And it was it's called a Cooper Time Cube, okay. and it's actually what uh, Ronnie Van Zant used to to sing through to get that doubling sound. So basically on one end, it's got a cannon jack mm -hmm. and then uh, it, it's, so it's got an input and then it just goes through this hose. If I'm telling this correctly, some, someone Look it up, more yeah. technical may be able to explain it. <laughs> you so know, kind of the same it. theory as like a talk box, but. A yeah. Okay. Well, it's just, it's basically just a delay is okay. what it is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Huh. And it's a doubling effect, but we use that on Kelly's vocal on uh, on the song "Hand Me Down," so it really sounded, you know, you got that Ronnie Van Zant sound. Sure. So, um, but that was a ton of fun uh, hanging down there and hearing the stories from those guys and recording was was a great honor, you know. That's history. What? Well, and by yeah. that time too, is you're, you know, from playing at such an early age, being comfortable on stage and being comfortable in the studio and playing, you know, I mean that it's the 10,000 hours thing that you had probably already gotten so that you're comfortable going into a situation and playing. You know, well, not... now, I mean, at that point we, we had only been working. What had happened was we recorded, we had a little Ford track. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was a task cam for, yeah, yeah. you know, cassette, you know, it was a mm -hmm. four track cassette oh, recorder. Yeah down in our um, our rehearsal space okay. and we just recorded demos on that down there and uh, actually um, Pepper from COC you know those guys rehearsed right beside us uh, we had a demo tape and they were going out on the road and uh, he asked Godly like uh, hey man can I get a copy of this you know your your little demo tape and Audley was like yeah don't play it for anyone though <laughs> so he got up to New York and uh, Josh Sarvin, who had just uh, uh, just uh, joined the A and R team there, okay. he'd been working at Columbia, but they had just promoted him. Um, he asked Pepper. He goes, "Hey, man, you know, I'm just new to A and R. I'm looking for a group to sign. Do you know of anybody?" And Pepper said, "Well, listen to this." He played him our demo tape, and from that he came down to. Uh, we booked a show at the brewery where we used to play all the time. It's like our home club in Raleigh. He came down and saw us and signed us. Wow. But uh, 
But from there, from from getting to that point to going to Muscle Shoals, we really didn't have any studio experience except for just recording in our sure. in our little uh, uh, you know rehearsal space, and uh, and there was a studio that we did uh, use a little bit in Raleigh called Jag Studio. Mm-hmm. Um, a great guy named Byron helped us out a lot, and John Custer, our producer. But um, other than that, we didn't have any uh, recording experience at all. So we basically went from the basement of our rehearsal space to being thrust to the Muscle Shoals sound, you know, studio. One and it was legendary a whole, premier studios. Ever. Yeah, it was a whole new experience for us, you know. And like I say, just an honor. We were just like, you know, well, <laughs> we were just blown away just to be there, much less recording our own music. So. Sure. What bass were you using back then? Like a P bass, an old P? Back then, uh, I had a P bass, but I had just started playing, uh, for years, I played a Les Paul recording bass. Wow. Yeah. So that's the bass that I used uh, to record uh, pretty much every track on that album. That's amazing. Yeah. And I used that for years. Yeah. Okay. You still have it? Yeah. I still have it. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I love that. And then you're I may have it in the other room back there. I can drag it out. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> maybe I'll make you. Yeah. So everybody can see it, you know, this yeah. video too. And then, yeah. so um, did everybody move to Nashville or make the move? No. What happened? I'm sorry. I, I went oh, the no long way. I, I love the muscle. I mean, muscle shoals, man. That's, that's amazing. That's such a rad story. I'm sorry, I've gone down a rabbit hole of the whole history, but what happened was basically um, after that tour finished up that I was telling you, we went out behind the Brother album. We were out on the road for a year and a half. We ended up uh, parting ways with our original lead singer. So then we had a very hard time because he had a great voice. His name was Kelly Holland. Great singer. But we had a very hard time uh, finding a replacement for him which finally we did uh, in the form of a a singer named Robert Mason. Okay. Um, And we, by the time we recorded our second album and uh, the album came out, it was two years down the road and we had just lost all of our momentum. Uh, In fact, I don't think, you know, things had changed a little bit at the record company and we didn't have quite as much push behind the record. And it was a different sounding album. Um, Robert's a great singer. His voice just sounded a little bit different from Kelly. Uh, and people were kind of used to Kelly. But uh, nonetheless, we recorded a great second album called Diamonds and Debris. Okay. And, um, and we just, we kind of lost all of our momentum. So, uh, so that, you know, the writing was on the wall. We were kind of coming to the end as a band. So uh, Audley went in, went on uh, after that to join the Black Crows. Oh, man. And then uh, uh, Jason had already moved down, our drummer had moved down to Austin, mm-hmm. Texas, and joined a guy named Chris Duarte, who's a legendary blues guitar player. Okay. And uh, fairly soon after he was down there, maybe a year or so, I had gone back to school when I was telling you about CVCC. Yeah. I was taking classes there. I'd moved back uh, to my mom and dad's because my dad had had some health issues. Mm. But Jason called me. My dad was doing better. And he said, hey, man, we need a bass player. And I told Chris about you. So I ended up moving down to Austin, Texas from yeah. from from my hometown where I'd moved back to. And I lived down there for about five years. And the way I got to Nashville was, uh, and while I was down there, I played with a guy named Jack Ingram, great Texas artist. I played with Chris Duarte for about a year. And I immediately, after Cry of Love split up, I'd played with this, joined this great band from Festus, Missouri called the Bottle Rockets. Okay. And so I had played with them and I was playing with them when I'd moved to Austin, but we had taken a little hiatus as well. So anyway, what happened was, was a great friend of mine, uh, Sean Seamus Bacon. Uh, he was running front of house for a country artist named Chris Cagle. Hmm. And they were in need of a bass player. And I happened to have like two weeks off. And uh, Chris was a fan of Cry of Love. 
So he was like, man, come up here. He had called me a couple of times. He's like, come up here and, you know, play bass with me. Mm -hmm. So I decided to come up, you know, not knowing what to expect. So, and that was in 2005. So I came up, played with Chris. We went out and did about a two week run. And then I just decided, you know, I'm going to move to Nashville. Sure. So that's how I got to Nashville was uh, in 2005. Okay. I took this country gig with Chris Cagle wow. and uh, played with him for two years. And then Jack Ingram, who I was playing with in Texas, mm -hmm. he was coming up uh, nationally. Uh, he had a, um, a number one hit on country charts called uh, Wherever You Are. Hmm. So that had hit big. And so he wanted me to come back and play with him. So I went back and played with Jack for another two years, but I still remained in Nashville. Okay. So, uh, so I just, uh, I've been here since 2005. So that's how the, uh, move happened. Okay. Sorry for the long no, <laughs> back no, history. It, <laughs> Was it, did you, so obviously playing with these people, did you pick up other gigs, other sessions, obviously, you know, being uh, not so much at that time. It, it, mm -hmm. it took me a little while, uh, from being in town, you know, to, um, uh, to kind of get my name established out there. But, um, but yeah, mainly I was just doing the, the Chris Cagle gig mm -hmm. and then the Jack Ingram gig. And, uh, a, a few, you know, I would pick up a few things here and there, sure. but, um, uh, yeah. That's yeah. cool, man. And then yeah. how, um, the Cheryl Crow gig, I mean, that's, yeah. Did you, did you have to like in the big picture? Did you have to do a lot of auditions, not just with Cheryl, but other people? Did you prep for that, or did you? Yeah. Well, I'll continue on with my history. A bit. I love it. Well, I love it. What Do happened it. was when I went back to Jack Ingram. I played with him after playing with Chris Cagle for two years. Okay. I played with Jack for about two uh, two years, and then um, I had decided I was going to leave and go play uh, with a buddy of mine. I got offered to do a gig with Edwin McCain. I don't know if you know who Edwin is, yeah, yeah. but um, uh, he's a great artist, great singer, songwriter. And uh, he had offered me the gig to play with him. So I was like, sure. So I started playing with uh, Edwin and I had only been playing with him a month or two. Mm -hmm. And I got a call from Ricky Medlock, who I had, had a, a little bit of a rapport with mm -hmm. from uh, when we were in Cry of Love, Audley and I, we opened up a couple of shows with Blackfoot, which was his band, Blackfoot. Yeah. And then at this time, I think in 1997, when we put out our second album, uh, Cry of Love, he had gotten a job with Leonard Skinner. So he was back with Leonard Skinner. So I had just started playing with Edwin and Ricky called me and he said, Robert, he goes, <laughs> we're looking for somebody to uh, fill in on the bass position with Skinner. And so uh, so he said, listen, and this is, I'll never forget this, Ricky. He told me, matter of fact, he was like, listen, I'm telling you now, if you go and learn Leon's bass parts exactly like they are on the record mm -hmm. and come into this audition, this was an audition I had to do for Skinner. He said, just learn the parts exactly. That's all they want. They don't want any more, any less. Just play them. And, and I spent a, a, a many hours breaking down Leon's bass parts and trying to learn them exactly. But that's what I did. Um, and so I had an audition for Leonard Skinner, mm -hmm. you know, which were, was huge, you know, for me, like for, uh, for anybody, I think. I mean, yes. that's such a legendary band, and those, that's big shoes to fill. Huge, huge shoes yeah. to fill. Yeah. Well, actually, what what had happened was uh, they had a great bass player at the time, Ian Evans, who had taken over uh, for Leon mm -hmm. when Leon had passed. In fact, Leon had kind of taken Ian under his wing. And uh, he was out on the road uh, with Skinner and Leon would show uh, Ian, you know, like, you know, on this part, you know, you do this, play this mm -hmm. here. But um, unfortunately, Ian was sick. Uh, he had taken ill. 
so they were just looking, uh, basically the audition was just for someone to come in and, um, take the position until Ian could get better to come rejoin the band. Yeah. So, um, so, uh, that's what it was. And, uh, and I remember, uh, I came in the room, the audition was at Blackbird studio here in Nashville. Sure. And, uh, I came in and the, you know, the way that the band set up, Leon was always on Gary Rossington's side of the stage okay. and stood right beside Gary. Mm -hmm. So when I went into the, the audition, that's the way they had it set up. And I was set up right beside Gary Rossington, which was like, man, holy cow, there's the guy that I've stared at for hours on the on these album covers. So you and now met gonna, any of them, you just walk in and boom. Well, I knew I knew Ricky. Sort okay, sort of knew Ricky. Sure, sure. I had I had a rapport with Ricky, but um never met any of the other guys, you know. And uh and they were just the sweetest and still are to this day. Johnny it's just uh, they were all great guys. Yeah, yeah. And so I went in and I felt like I played okay, you know. Okay. And right. uh, I felt like I did all right. <laughs> But I was one of the first ones in uh, to play. So when I came out, I saw all these other, you know, like A-list uh, bass players yeah. waiting. And I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> oh, but, you know, eventually, uh, so I got a call back. They didn't tell me anything. So I got a call back to come back and um, to audition. Because at the same time, they were needing a bass position position. They were also needing a keyboard player cause, uh, Billy Powell had just passed. Oh, got it. So I got a call back to, uh, help audition the keyboard players. Mm -hmm. Um, wow. so nobody's telling me anything. So I'm thinking like, I'm going to play <laughs> a couple of songs and somebody else is coming in. So I, we start trying out these keyboard players and, um, I remember just playing and I'm kind of looking around. Nobody says anything. So they, they keep coming in, these keyboard guys, and I'm still here playing. And we just go through the songs. I'm like, okay. Wow. I'm thinking to myself, this is, seems pretty good. <laughs> so, so, I'm still uh, here. I'm still playing. So I'm still here. I'm still playing. So, um, so anyway, uh, so we try out all these keyboard guys. And at the end of the thing, you know, everybody we go into the break room and nobody says anything and and they're talking about the keyboard guys and so i'm like okay and and then finally ricky uh says uh he goes hey robert by the way welcome to the family you know so i'm like oh my gosh oh, you know so man. so that how, was um, so how long did you did you play with with leonard skinner uh i ended up playing with them for three years um, so, uh, and unfortunately, um, um, uh, rest his soul, Ian never recovered to join the band. So, uh, he unfortunately passed and, uh, then I was the bass player. That's so, um, so what happened is during that time, uh, we had, we had formed a side band called Big Hat. It was myself, uh, Audley, Freed, uh, Fred Eltringham. Mm -hmm. uh, on drums, uh, Keith Gaddis was our lead singer. Um, uh, and, uh, we had Peter Stroud who was, um, who was Cheryl Crow's longtime guitar player. Okay. So, and I think they were on a, a little bit of a hiatus cause Cheryl had recorded a, uh, she had recorded a R and B album with Doyle Bramhall yeah. and she had formed, she had this longtime band, but when, when she went out to tour behind that R&B album, it's called A uh, Hundred Miles from Memphis, uh, she she formed a whole new band to tour behind that. So Peter had kind of been working. He had played off and on with Sarah McLaughlin mm -hmm. and some with Don Henley. But he said, hey, you know, let's form this side band. Uh, and we called it Big Hat. Um, and, uh, and so... Uh, so anyway, we went down and recorded the demo down at Southern Tracks in Atlanta. Okay. And, uh, and we never really went out and played live. We just recorded that demo, which was a ton of fun. Sure. And, um, and so, uh, so what happened was Cheryl, um, 
she had finished up the tour behind that R and B band and she needed a band. She wanted to get a rock band back together. And, uh, there was a benefit down in new Orleans for the uh, hurricane relief. I believe it was. Yeah. And it was, uh, uh, put on at, uh, by Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie were okay. together at that point. Mm -hmm. And it was a huge deal. So she needed a band. So she went to Peter and said, Hey, I need a band, you know, to do this benefit. And Peter said, well, what about these guys I've been playing with, <laughs> you know? So we did a rehearsal in Nashville and, uh, it went, it went fairly well. I'm not certain that, Cheryl was convinced at the time that I was the right guy, but uh, everybody, uh, Audley and uh, Fred, and uh, and actually at the same time uh, we uh, they brought in Josh Grange, who's a steel guitar player. Okay. So uh, and this all we all kind of met and rehearsed at the same time with Cheryl. So anyway, so uh, initially she was like, okay, we, we went down and did the benefit and it went okay. And so uh, she was like, she needed a band for the summer. So she was like, um, uh, okay, well, I'm going to offer th this band the job for the summer. So basically what I had to do was I had to, I had to think about, uh, Okay, so I've got this, on one hand, I'm playing with Leonard Skinner, which I know is a secure, great gig that a thousand bass players would oh, kill man. to have. Yeah. Or over here, I can play with Cheryl with all of my buddies, you know, and um, and it's uncertain whether this is going to go on after this summer. It's only guaranteed through the summer. Mm -hmm. So, man, I agonized over that decision Cause I was going to have to leave Skinner to go do the Cheryl gig, uh, which was only guaranteed through the summer. Sure. So, man, I agonized and agonized what to do over that gig. But, um, so I finally just made a decision to go for it. I was like, I'm just, I'm just going to go for it and see what happens. Wow. And, uh, so I did, I, uh, I had to tell the guys in Skinner, you know, I was going to go, Mm -hmm. uh, play with Cheryl and it was hard. It was the hardest, hardest thing in music. I think I've, I've ever had to do, but, uh, as it turned out, you know, we played through the summer mm -hmm. and at the end of the summer, uh, Cheryl called and offered me the gig on a permanent basis, you know, so, that's so it worked out. So, yeah. that's, uh, that's a huge, like that was, like, yeah. I can't even imagine. Wow. It was, it was, uh, it, it really, uh, it took a toll on me emotionally to, sure. to, <laughs> to well, try, you know, to, to make those phone calls. Cause I called everyone individually to tell them, cause I didn't want anyone hearing through the grapevine, yeah. you know, and especially uh, Johnny and Ricky and Gary were so sweet to me and they still are to this yeah. day. I, I just went to see them uh, a couple of months ago, play at the Ryman and they sounded great and they're so still so sweet and, you know, well, it sounds and, like you uh, did it the right way. You were, you know, there, you did it the right way. You did yeah, it yeah. even and, and, and well, yeah. there's no reason to, you know, no. with, with people that are that talented and it's a legacy band and, yeah. you know, and uh, they bring such joy to the fans still to this day. And you never want to, you know, burn bridges or leave on a sour note, or at least I don't anyway. No, I, well, I think that gives you longevity in your career too. And just, and actually a, a clear conscience, you know, like, yeah, yeah. you have to be a good person and you have to be nice, you know, no matter what. So you did it, you did it the right well, way. Well, if you think about it before, because, you know, I never, uh, up until the Skinner gig, I had never really made any real music. In, mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, I'd never made any, real money <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, you know i was always living just kind of hand to mouth in the yeah, yeah. music business i was just so stubborn to i was too stubborn to quit but i mean i made enough i wasn't uh, you know living in poverty but i made enough to pay my bills but yeah. never really uh was able to you know store anything back you know for a savings yeah. but those guys you know they uh not only you know, the prestige of having that gig, but it, it kind of took me up to, uh, 
to the a next level, you Absolutely. know, yeah. to be able to say that I played with those guys. So I owe them a, grit of, uh, a debt of gratitude, you know. So, um, and I just, uh, I, you know, I still love them to this day. So well, I'm sure the awesome. feeling is mutual too, you know. You stepped <laughs> in and you did a good job. You honored, you know, the... the well, the I tried to. I, I, I tried to do my best, so... That's all. And so the Cheryl thing, what year was that? Um, that was in, uh, so I, I, I got the Skinner gig in 2009 uh -huh. and I played with them from 2009 to 2012. And then that's when um, I, I jumped over and started playing with Cheryl in 2012. Wow. And it's been ever since. And man, Cheryl yeah. is, I mean, you're a monster bass player. She's, she's an amazing, like just musician. And she's a uh, oh yes. Bass player. Oh yes. All around. Yeah. Well, you know, she has a degree uh, in music from the University of Missouri, uh, and so yeah, she can. She's a fantastic piano player. Uh, in fact, she can kill it on the piano, mm -hmm. and uh, and everything else. She's a great harmonica player. Sure. She plays bass, guitar. Yeah. Uh, she's just you know <laughs> all around and sings unbelievably you know her uh i don't think that i've uh ever heard her hit a bad note wow. and she can just you know she can kill it so and she wow. brings it every night so yeah yeah she's amazing so and then that band is that the band she takes in the studio recording sometimes you know what's uh a lot of times in the studio she actually plays the bass okay but sometimes yeah. she'll write the songs on the bass and, sure. and her and her, uh, uh, if she doesn't write the song by herself, she co-writes a lot with uh, Jeff Trot. Okay. And yeah. they've had a lot of, a lot of her hits were co-written with Jeff. Wow. So, uh, and so when they're writing together, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think she plays bass a okay. lot of times. So she'll yeah. just lay down the bass track herself. That's so, so cool, man. But I have had the uh, uh, privilege of, recording bass for her uh on a number of tunes so that's been an honor that's awesome man that's rad thank you i i love the history and i i didn't realize that you had played that you were in leonard skinner for those yeah years. that yeah. is that's legendary man that is oh man it was such an honor yeah. to play with those guys but and, you know. and you're still friends with them and, and yeah they love you. yeah you still love them and you have that camaraderie that's that's something that'll never be taken away, you know, and, and that's a testament to you. So that's, that's awesome, man. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. So then, you know, obviously in 2020, we had COVID, you know, everybody was yeah. out on the road and then March, April of 2020, it, it just shut down. Um, were you, you guys were touring right before yes. on the road yeah. and then everything kind of came to a halt, huh? Yes. We, we, um, we really didn't do anything for too much of anything for two years. Okay. Uh, although Cheryl was, uh, she was very gracious in the fact that she, um, what we did do and what she wanted to do was we just, uh, we did some home videos of some yeah. of her hits, but we actually played them live. We, we, we all had our own little recording ways to record our own parts and then we would video that as well at the same time. And then she would just put a compilation video of all of us together at home yeah. playing, you know, some of her hit songs. I think I've seen some. Of it. It's interesting <clears throat> the way that people pivoted and had to. Yes. And yeah, kept, absolutely. And kept it alive, you know, and, and I, you know, yeah. you, <clears throat> Cheryl, to everybody, you know, they, they pivoted to this this new model of virtual concerts uh virtual that's concerts. right you know i the bass hang has had a podcast forever when i first started the bass hang in 2010 but we started this thing called the big bottom <laughs> podcast with uh tony puleo from gk amps blue man group and my buddy jonathan moody from ghs okay. and we just were like you know what we're in quarantine so let's do this podcast so we talked to a bunch of people and you know, it, it was just something to do to keep obviously mentally stable and mentally, I mean, I don't know, it was emotional and it was weird because you couldn't hang with people. You couldn't, so it was almost the next best thing. 
and yes. you saw a lot of people pivoting, you know, and it was, you know, thank God we had that, you know, and, I know. and, and everybody was able to, you know, and Zoom, <laughs> you know, everybody was doing Zoom things, you know, and it was, uh, it was a way to, you know, you couldn't physically be close, but at least this way you felt closeness, you know, and it was, um, it was a way to, to get around it, you know, absolutely and emotionally. Did you, um, were you doing more home stuff? Did you yourself pivot to a different, uh, you know, doing home recordings, uh, remote sessions? How did you navigate that? Uh, I did, I did a few home recordings, mm -hmm. but mainly those videos, uh, for Cheryl, the way that we would put those together, you know, that kind of kept, kept, kept me going, uh, for sure. And then man, I just, um, outside of music, I just did a lot of home projects, just yeah. things that I needed, <laughs> things I needed to do around my house. I, uh, I had, uh, learned how to, uh, uh, and YouTube's amazing, amazing, as you know, oh but you God. can learn so many things. I learned, I painted my garage door, <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, and I painted it where it, uh, fate, it looks uh, like it's wood, you know, if, from 10 feet away, but yeah. you get up on it, it's paint. <laughs> yeah, so basically it's YouTube university. That's you it. Yeah. Any tutorial that you, from fixing a dryer to painting, you just, Okay, you too. Uh, how to do this, and and you'll find something, you know. So that's right. That's uh, amazing. Me and a buddy of mine, uh, Shaky Folks, who's a who's a great drummer here in town, but also he knows his, he's a uh, he can he's a, he can do everything. He's a Renaissance man. But uh, he and I built a shed. I built a storage shed in the back uh, on my back property. Wow. Uh, yeah, and and then I got the bug to. Um, I've um, collected posters of gigs that I've done over the years, but I've had them stacked up. I've had so many and I've never done anything with them. So then I finally got the bug to start framing, framing yeah. those up. Wow. So that was one of my projects. I just tried to keep myself busy, sure. you know. <laughs> That's awesome. And then what was it? 20, late 21, no, late mid 22 was kind of when everybody started kind of going back on the road, right? Was it? Yeah. 22. Yeah. Yeah. We went out a little bit last year. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Um, how, uh, yeah. how was it? Did you find it kind of cobwebs or was it just, man, for me, it was, it was great because I'm, um, I'm one of the only, uh, single guys in the band, you know, and I don't have any kids or anything. So, I was, I told our tour manager, I said, Hey man, you can book this tour beginning in uh, first of spring. And I don't care if we don't come home until the end of fall. Cause I'm so sick of being in this house by myself. Yeah, I'm over it. But of course, everybody else, you know, they're married and they have kids and you know, uh, yeah, you have to, you have to respect everybody's wherever that's they're right. at mentally. You got to respect. That's them. right. That's right. Yeah. And I think a lot of people have, have gotten used to being home, you know, during the pandemic. So, and that's cool. Uh, but I was just raring to go. And, uh, but, you know, it, it was okay. It, it, it did take a little time to adjust to being back out on the road after, uh, after not, you know, you get in the tour bus and start heading down the road. And the first night, it always takes me a couple of nights to adjust to the, you know, this rocking back and forth in your bunk to, to get asleep. But after, after night two, I'm good to go. So that's awesome, man. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm so glad. And right now, obviously you're back out touring, playing whatever gigs. Uh, with yeah. We're, I think we just have a lot of one-offs actually this year. I, I don't know if we, if we're out full on the road or not, okay. uh, but all the dates haven't come in yet. So Got it. yeah, those yeah. are coming in. That's awesome. Yeah. All right. So a couple of questions for you. Sure. What is your, so when you go on tour. Yeah. Um, must have gear that you, you know, obviously there's the bases that you have. Do you have, um, do you have certain things that you, you really need and, and maybe even people out there wanting to tour, like what are your must haves? Well, now, uh, well, it depends on the gig, but obviously with the Cheryl gig, which is the main thing, um, uh, I, I have to have, because some of her hits like, um, uh, happy, if it makes you happy, yeah. 
-hmm. and every day is a winding road. Mm -hmm. uh, those songs uh, require a five string bass because uh, there's a couple of spots in the song where it goes down. It incorporates the low. I don't know if it, it the low B string, I don't sure. know. It's not a B note, but it goes down to a, uh, uh, C, I think, sure. uh, winding road goes down to a low C. You gotta hit that low C, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and and I do it. You know, I could learn it on the four string, but I try to yeah. keep true to the way. You know, when that song was recorded, mm -hmm. a lot of the five string was. You know, I think a lot of people were just coming on, and it was really being incorporated in a lot of recordings uh, during that time in the nineties, but. Um, so I have to I use a five string. Mm -hmm. uh, there are certain pedals that I use uh, for her songs, such as All I Want to Do is ha Have Some Fun sure. on the chorus of that song, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an octave pedal. So so there's a uh, uh, I use a Boss OC2 oh, yeah. octave pedal, which I, is still my favorite octave pedal to this day. It's one of the um, best. Is it, is it an older one? It's an older one, yeah. yeah. In fact, I have a couple of them just okay. for backup, just in case. <laughs> well, it, but, it, uh, it has, it's one of the <clears throat> there's um there's a few of them that have that. Well, it's an it's like an analogish type of sound too. Yes, and and the the imperfection of it is almost the appeal. Exactly, right? because it's yeah. not perfect, and sometimes okay. you have to play you have to adjust your playing in a certain way to to bring that note out, you know? And then obviously I think it's what, the C on the A string, the third fret is kind of the lowest that you can do because if you go lower, isn't it? Oh like, yeah, yeah. Right, then it starts gurgling and, and wobbling. So you have to, but the imperfection is kind of the, the thing with that pedal, with the OC2, it's the vibe. The, uh, I, well, I don't, I never go that low. So, yeah, you can, yeah. you can but, with the OC2. Uh, yeah, yeah, but, uh, I like it just uh, first off the tone of that pedal it, it to my ears it sounds great and um, it actually uh, it, it tracks it fairly well uh, for me it works uh, just on the passages that I sure. use it on so um, uh, but yeah so I, I have to incorporate uh, or I incorporate the octave pedal mm -hmm. and then there are a couple of um, songs of hers that uh i use a fuzz or an overdrive got pedal it. on pretty heavy Wait. there's a song uh she's got called steve mcqueen uh and in the middle bridge of that song there's a fuzz bass which, also, uh, which pedal which pedal do you use for that uh well there's a there is a a pedal on that one i use a um kind of an obscure pedal called a fender sublime Okay. Pedal. It's a huge pedal. It's probably a foot long wow. and it's green and it's got this lighted dial. The more that you turn the fuzz all the way up, it goes from green all the way to red. <laughs> of course, I have it up all the way. Just grindy. Uh, yeah. 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 yeah so, and they're a little bit hard to. I looked on. Um, uh, re I probably shouldn't even be saying it because it, people may, don't <laughs> but I, them. Don't, don't. Yeah, <laughs> don't. I think they stopped making that pedal a while. They right? stopped making making them. I looked on Reverb uh, not too long ago and they were, you know, they're like $250 now or something. Yeah, <laughs> you know, they're great. getting up there. But anyway, uh, so I used that on Steve McQueen and there's another song called uh, A Change Would Do You Good that has a, that has a fuzz bass all the way through it. So uh, I use it on that one. And then there's a, uh, on this last, um, she put out a documentary mm -hmm. uh, uh, last year, it came out on Showtime. And uh, she redid uh, the Rolling Stones song, Live With Me. Okay. And uh, the way that, that uh, she and Jeff Trott uh, recorded it, it's got a fuzz bass on it as well. And for that, I use the... Um, Oh, she, what's the name? Um, I'll think of it in a second. I just had it on my brain, but I use a different fuzz for that one. And yeah. Am amplification wise, you have all your back line or you Well, now or for years, I was an Ampeg SVT guy. I mean, that's what I used all through a uh, cry of love. 
Yeah. Um, Chris Duarte, Bottle Rockets, uh, and Skinner. I had two SVT rigs with those guys. But um, what's happened is uh, it's become a little bit I, – I got down to where it was a little bit uh, too much volume for our gig with Cheryl. Okay. Uh, and I had gotten down to where I could just barely crack it on, and it still seemed to be a little bit too much. <laughs> Uh, so I, I've switched over to this head. It's called a fat Jimmy okay. head and it's hand wired. Uh, there's a, a guy out of, uh, the San Francisco Bay area that makes them and, uh, they're great heads. It's just like a hundred watt basement, sure, all but man, it puts out a ton of sound. And, uh, so I, I just have this hundred watt tube head that I play through and, uh, Ampeg SVT 410. 410, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that seems to work fairly well because it doesn't seem to, uh, to you know, the, the SVT is so, is so huge and it just goes, you know, as bass waves do, they just go yeah. everywhere. <laughs> but, it's, but it's the sound. And it, it and, is. Oh, and yeah. If you, if you don't have to be lugging it around and you can have it set up for you that, that even that, that's <laughs> that's the, that's the best of both worlds i kind of uh uh i kind of uh relate the ampeg svt for bass players to how a uh leslie uh a hammond b3 and a leslie is for uh, you know key organ players because well, it's got that same sure. you know uh signature sound you know yeah, there's nothing that sounds, in both cases, there's nothing that sounds like a Ampeg SVT or a Hammond B3 Leslie cabinet combo, yeah. but they're beasts to move. <laughs> that's the caveat, you know, but that's yeah, exactly. sound, you know, if I show exactly. up the back line and I see like an SVT with an 810, I'm like, oh, this is beautiful. It's, yeah. it's just exactly. absolute power and absolute sound. It just sounds good. You can't, they just... That's the tone. No matter what bass you're plugging in, it just sounds good. Uh, it, yeah, you can get an incredible sound. Yeah, yeah. yeah no problem. That, that's cool, man. Do you uh, do you have any uh, spinal tapish moments from a gig that, like one moment that just super spinal tap? Because almost every gig has spinal tap moments. Yeah. You know? Oh, I'm yeah. sure I have a a ton of them. One I, I do out. remember uh, right off the top of my head. I can yes. remember. Um, when Audley and I and uh, Jason and Kelly were in the band Cry of Love, uh -huh. I think we were out in the San Jose area, mm -hmm. and we had to do a, um, w w for some reason, we had to do, we did a lot of uh, radio, you know, uh, visiting radio stations sure. and making appearances here or there. But for some reason, they had us, um, uh, at a, uh, a go-kart facility, uh, which was like an entertainment complex. But this radio station decided that they were going to do a live remote okay. from uh, uh, a go-kart facility, uh, which, you know, had, you know, video games and other stuff. But the main thing was the go-kart. So we're out there. We're trying to play acoustic. Our song's acoustic. With these go karts going by, oh, and we're we're having a hard time hearing ourselves, much less anybody else who was there. So I was just thinking to myself, like, man, this is very Spinal Tap here. Absolutely, that's <laughs> awesome. How about a a very memorable gig moment? Uh, just super memorable live or whatever, just a, just a, something that stands out that, wow, that was rad. I mean, obviously you've had Muscle Shoals, uh, you've had brushes with, you know, obviously gig yeah. innered and yeah. know, all these people. Any any real memorable moments from a gig? Well, uh, last year I got a call um, uh, uh, to go fill in. Uh, this was on a Thursday. Uh, I got... Uh, called from Mickey Raphael, who is uh, Willie Nelson's longtime harmonica player wow. since 1973. Okay. And uh, their bass player, fantastic ba bass player, Kevin Smith, uh, acquired COVID. Oh. So he called me on a Thursday and said, uh, 
Robert, are you busy this weekend? I was like, well, I'm not gigging. He goes, can you come to Austin and play with us? It, it was, it was Willie's, uh, all these things aligned. It was a Willie's 89th birthday. They were opening up a brand new, uh, uh, center uh arena in downtown austin called the moody center uh willie was opening for george Strait in the round at at the moody center and uh he gave me a whole list of songs and he uh he they sent me a board tape and this was on this was about this time on a thursday i don't know 11 or so wow. and uh and i practiced all all night, all day, into the night. And the next morning, I was on a flight to Austin. I got, I got to the, uh, got picked up, went straight to the room, tried to practice a little bit more, but then immediately had to go over to the gig and tried to go over some of the tunes with the, uh, with the guys in the uh, dressing room. And then um, I went out. And we played the gig. I went up to the stage. I never saw Willie until he walked up the stairs. He looked over at me and gave me a nod. And we kicked off Whiskey River. They counted it off and right into Whiskey River. And man, I got goosebumps. I was like, this is incredible. It's Willie's birthday. Uh, and the first night I did, I got to say, it was, I thought it was like maybe 80, 20. There was about 20% there. Sure. And this is just my take. You may ask somebody and they may say, yeah. no, nah, it was worse than that. <laughs> but there was a couple of, the, what happened was there was a couple of sections mm -hmm. where I got, I got tangled up because they sent me a board tape, but a uh, Mickey had warned me. He was like, listen, you just got to have big ears, which you yeah. need to have big ears on any gig. But he said with Willie, sure. he goes, you've got to, cause he may not do the song the same way. He may, you know, leave out a verse or he yeah. may Jump leave out the bridge the sure, sure. or he may, he may, you know, add something. So, so what happened was that the heart, the, for me, the hardest part of the set was there was a medley mm -hmm. of, of songs between, uh, ain't it funny how time slips away into crazy into the nightlife. Yeah. So we're going through and I get through the first two. All right. Well, we get to nightlife. And then Willie launched, so he, uh, and I tried to chart out as much as I could, you know, uh, and uh, he, we got to Nightlife and he started playing a solo. Well, on the board tape I had, he, uh, there was no solo. There was, he hadn't played a guitar solo on that night. So he launched into a solo and I'm like, uh-oh. Uh I'm like, now is this over the chorus or yeah, the yeah. verse? Or the... And I wasn't sure mm -hmm. <laughs> because it was just just me, you know, uh, um, and and Billy, the drummer, and Mickey. And, you know, Mickey was just playing Phil's sure. uh, at, at that point. He hadn't launched into playing a solo. And so I was trying to like, what? part of the song is this yeah. so i got a little bit that got a little uh sideways for me and uh but we eventually got back i got got it back together and reeled it in but for the most part but then the next night of course i thought it went i, I did about as good as i could have possibly done on the saturday night and uh of course all the writers and critics were there on the friday night so oh, they didn't man. see <laughs> oh. but but anyway, it was just an honor for me to look over and like, oh, my God, there's Willie. You know, I'm playing with Willie Nelson on his birthday in the round at a brand new opening of a downtown arena in Austin, Texas, where I used to live for five years. It's now, crazy. Did you get to talk to Willie or? or I did. Yeah. Uh, the, so on the Sunday, they had a um, birthday gathering for uh, tons of notable artist uh out at luck uh luck reunion uh where willie lives they had a whole birthday show uh for him uh, you know steve earl was there robert earl king um uh margo price uh cheryl was there uh just tons of artists uh uh ray wiley hubbard um on and on and on as you can imagine 
So, uh, so before Willie came out, they were, what happened was they were trying, they were so nervous about him getting COVID. They were keeping him quarantined. They really didn't want him to be around anyone. Sure. As you can imagine, you know, um, so they kept him sequestered. So and, until right before, uh, you know, Cheryl and Willie are really good friends yeah. and have been for a number of years. So uh, Annie, uh, Willie's um, wife, uh, told Cheryl, like, look, we're going to come over here about 10 minutes before Willie goes up mm -hmm. um, uh, to play because he played an hour after all these artists did a tribute to him. He got up and played about an hour set. And she said, we're going to go over here and you can meet with Willie over here. So when I got over there, you know, uh, I got to go uh, with Cheryl and, you know, she talked to him mainly, but he, he looked over and he goes, sounded good up there, you know, which was really, I was like, thank you, sir. It was just, it was just an honor to play with, you know, and he was very sweet. He let me take a picture with him and uh, just, uh, it was uh, well, that's a testament to you, too. You know, it, there's nothing like getting, uh, being a working musician, Get uh, again, I, I always use the, the 10,000 hours thing. Like, you've had that experience, and that, you know, culminates into you being on stage, last-minute gig, having the ears to actually pull that off. You did your homework, but obviously, you know, everything changes. I mean, I don't think I've ever been on a gig where everything goes as planned. It, it never does. So you always right, be ready right. for it, you know, and that's right. You yeah. know, going into a solo and you're like, okay, is this the verse changes? Are these the <laughs> chorus changes? What are the changes? So, you know, it, it's a testament yeah. to you and, and just your your ability to to step up and, and do that and to do it with such a legend, man. That's oh, wow. incredible. That's amazing, man. Well, dude, I, I you know, that this has been so fun. I hope it's been fun for you. It it has it has. I don't do a lot of interviews actually, so this is a. I get nervous sometimes. So oh, I hope dude, I, you did great, hope man. I and, and you know, I, I I really appreciate your friendship and really getting to know you. And one of these days, when you're out here, Southern California, if I'm traveling, I would I would love to come and see the show. I, I absolutely. I you know Cheryl's just just so legendary and she's so talented, and I'm I'm just so excited for you. You know, being part of that band and and just it just seems like such a rad like a happy band you know really it cool is situation. yeah yeah and okay. that comes from her you know that starts comes from the head down so sure. she she keeps it that way she's uh she's she's good like that she's really yeah. really good that's amazing man well it's been a pleasure robert and and Thank as you. i kind of end all these interviews we go into the green room so i stop recording but okay but we're gonna still keep chatting. We're gonna some some industry secrets. <laughs> okay. All right, man. Robert, I really appreciate you, man. Thank you for talking. Sure. Thank and everybody, you. big hand out there. You know, when you're watching, everybody's gonna be clapping. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks again, Robert. I'm gonna stop the recording and then we're gonna keep okay, talking. Bye. All right, bud.